One of the events uh, that occurred for me when I was at the recent North American Collegium meeting in Spring Valley, New York at the end of May was a feeling that I needed to talk about Percy Mackay in our section meetings again. I have spoken about Percy a few times in past years, but not during the time of COVID when Novalis came forward prominently into our meetings. And on the final morning of the meeting in Spring Valley, it was a clear sunny day, I awoke with a very strong impulse to speak Percy Mackay's name at the meeting when we shared experiences of the night. I did this, and I was surprised and actually quite gratified at what came back very strongly to me as a result. So tonight I will reintroduce a person whom I introduced to our section group several times briefly in past years, the American poet and playwright Percy Mackay. He was the son of the famous 19th century American actor Steele Mackay, the father of Arvia Mackay or Arvia Mackay Egge, Christy Mackay or Christy Mackay Barnes, father of Robin Mackay, father in law of Henry Barnes, the husband of Marion Morse, a close friend and poet colleague of Albert Steffen. He also account counted among his friends and acquaintances persons such as Robert Frost, Woodrow Wilson, and the Wilson family, and many others. He was a celebrity. He was a poet, playwright, dramatist, impresario, and biographer, quite well known and celebrated in his time, but largely forgotten today. His style of theater and poetry his imagination of the literary arts and humanities, and indeed the America he inhabited and imagined from 1875 to 1956, it has almost disappeared. But this is not an exercise in nostalgia tonight. It's not a longing for the good old days that really never existed in a truly good old sense. No, no. Rather, it's an exercise in spirit remembering. Since, as I've said many times, spirit remembering is one of the important things that we do in the literary humanistic disciplines, among other creative tasks. We cultivate spirit remembrance of the dead by means of texts, I began to talk about this a little bit last year at this time, when I gave a presentation on James Joyce and modernism. Tonight's introductory talk is meant to plant a seed for future talks and discussions, hopefully. I know that at least two members of our group have had close personal acquaintanceship with Percy's daughters, Arvia and Christie. And I do hope that at the end of the talk tonight, those friends and others will share memories. My relationship to Percy Mackay and to the Mackay family is strictly literary. I learned of him as I learned about Novalis and Goethe and Shakespeare and any other author who is dead by reading books by him or her or about him or her. I read primary literature first and then secondary literature, such as criticism and biography. I also learn about the dead by translating and writing. With Percy Mackay, as with Novalis, the more I became acquainted with him and his extended family and his historical environment, the more I came to appreciate that he brings to our section work a very important impulse that is American. Percy Mackay reaches back to Emerson and the New England Renaissance, for example, to authors and texts that we haven't dealt with yet in our meetings. Unlike Novalis from Saxony, 
Percy speaks to us in an American Yankee lingo derived from New York City streets, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the New England countrysides and farmlands that he knew and grew up in. At the same time, he is North American in the inclusive Michaelic sense that we use this term in our section. Between Emerson and Mackay, we can trace a continuity. Now, just for the record, I personally connected with Mackay because he is so American. When I wrote my long American novel, Sanctuary, about 10 years ago, I researched the use of the word sanctuary as a title by other authors. Spelled conventionally, my book has X the word sanctuary for thematic reasons, as you can see from the title here. Uh, but spelled conventionally, sanctuary was a title used by William Faulkner for a novel and by Percy Mackay for a mask about a bird sanctuary. Now, I'll say more about Percy Mackay's bird sanctuary mask soon and his use of the mask as a dramatic form. But don't worry, William Faulkner, is, he's not on the agenda tonight. As I mentioned, Percy Mackay is a son of a famous American actor, inventor, impresario, and dramatist, Steele Mackay, who spent his life in the theater. Steele was the first American actor to play Hamlet in England, he was a celebrity in his time, like Percy, and he was friends with many people we consider famous. For example, Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison installed electric lights in Steele Mackay's New York theater. It was the first use of electric lights in a theater. Really, Steele Mackay is worth an evening in himself, and Percy, his son, spent about 10 years writing a monumental biography of his father, and we'll have to talk about the genre of biography as we deepen our acquaintance with the Mackays. Biography was a significant literary form for them. Now, also significant was Hamlet and Hamlet's creator, William Shakespeare. They were predominant concerns for Father Steele and Son Percy throughout their lives. One might really consider Shakespeare and Hamlet to be spiritual mentors or guides for father and son, spirit guides, as it were. Percy Mackay, like his father, found in the theater culture of Sophoclean Athens and Shakespeare's London, a model and an ideal and a high point of the drama. Uh, think of Friedrich Hebel in this regard for also. Son and father were inspired by these two examples of Athens and London to think of the theater and drama as something essential to the spiritual health of a civil society, as we call it these days. Now, please note the 1623 date on this title page, we're coming up to the 400-year anniversary of what many consider to be a Rosicrucian publication. I'm referring here, of course, to the first folio of Shakespeare's plays. You see the picture right now. One might argue that the first folio, along with the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, is one of the most significant Rosicrucian publications of the present age. So, along with 1923, our section, I think, needs to pay attention to this date, 1623, as we approach our important year of celebration, 2023, and as we think about 1923. But moving on, for son and father, Shakespeare and Hamlet were not dead or imagined. They were livingly present and are livingly present. Much of Percy Mackay's writing has its source spring of inspiration in Shakespeare. At the end of his life, Percy wrote a tetralogy, that is four plays, based on events prior, events prior to Shakespeare's play Hamlet. And his play, Percy's play, received a production in Pasadena, California. Percy Mac
Kai was born in 1875. He died in 1956. And he lived a long life, like Goethe. And he was writing until the end. He didn't lose his marbles. And like Goethe, his life spanned a dramatic age. With Goethe, it was the age of revolution, industrial, political. Percy's life spans the high modernist years of the late 19th century and the middle 20th century. This was also, as we know, a time of revolutions and wars. And it ends with the Cold War, uh, or his life ends, rather, with the Cold War in the atomic era and the, and the birth pains of an emerging global world community. Now, for comparison, Thomas Mann was born the same year as Percy in 1875. Carl Jung was born in 1875. Rudolf Steiner was 14 years old when Percy was born. The poet Rainer Maria Rilke, 1875. 1875 was the year of the founding of the Theosophical Society in New York City, where Percy was born. And theosophy, by the way, in a modernist sense, is an American invention, one might argue, although many people just assume that it's an Indian affair. (laughs) Actually, it's quite homegrown, uh, just as anthroposophy is a German phenomenon, although I, I sometimes get in trouble for saying that. William Butler Yeats whose poetic style in some ways resembles Percy Mackay and who has a similar Celtic background, was born in 1865, so a little bit sooner, but still contemporary, Robert Frost, a poet friend of Percy and a a poet whose poetry does in many ways remind one of Percy's, was born in 1874. Now, by the way, just as an anecdote, Percy was responsible for getting Robert Frost a job as a poet in residence, so to speak, at a university. And Percy actually, you could say, invented the idea of the university writing program with poets and writers in residence holding forth. And like Emerson, whom Percy admired and understood, Percy attended Harvard. I'll say more about the connection to Emerson in future talks if there's an opportunity. And in 1923, Percy's daughter Arvia attended the Christmas Foundation Conference in Dornach. Now, let's look at one of the important dramatic forms used by Percy, the mask. Here, again, is a picture of young Percy Mackay in his costume as Alwyn the Poet from the Mask Sanctuary. It is followed by a few more pictures from Sanctuary. The Mask Sanctuary was staged outdoors in Meriden, New Hampshire. It was done at the request of the Bird Club of Meriden, New Hampshire. And at that time, bird sanctuaries were beginning to be established throughout the United States as part of a dawning nature conservancy movement. And that's that's Arvia, Percy's daughter, by the way, uh, looking a little bit uncomfortable there, to my view. As I mentioned, the Mackays were on friendly terms with many famous persons. Isadora Duncan, for example, uh, was a friend. She's not shown in this picture, but perhaps she's being imitated by the actress here. And Woodrow Wilson and his family were friends. Wilson's two daughters performed in the mask with the president and his wife in attendance in the front row. And this is an outdoor stage. I think you can get a sense of the difference between Percy Mackay's America and our America just by contemplating this outdoor theatrical on a lawn in New Hampshire and imagining the President of the United States sitting with his family in the front row watching his two daughters perform. (laughs) No Secret Service or hidden snipers anywhere on the set. Okay, what is a mask? In the American context of the 19th and early 20th century, the terms mask and pageant are often interchanged and confused, but they are not the same. In those years in America, pageants were staged as large public non-speaking events 
in which scenes from history were enacted like a living tableau. They often had strong patriotic overtones, such as pageants in celebration of the so-called discovery of America by Columbus, (laughs) or the political birth of the United States, the deeds of the Founding Fathers. They were large civic events in which thousands participated and many more thousands observed and enjoyed. Remember, we are in a time here before movies or giant amusement parks like Disney and Universal, and before the time of the big stadium sports extravaganzas. Pageants were what Aristotle classified as spectacles, and that means for him they were all sound and fury, in his opinion, because for Aristotle, the spectacle was the very lowest form of drama. It's what you did when you couldn't do anything better, like tragedy, for example. Uh, That's one reason, by the way, that I think Percy Mackay reinvented the mask. It is his main contribution to what he called civic theater or a theater of democracy. Because although originally masks were ginned up parties for the 1%, and you might think of Edgar Allan Poe's little ironic masterpiece, The Mask of the Red Death, for example, So although these were, like I said, parties for the 1%, Percy saw masks as a new democratic art form, quite quite a revolutionary point of view. If you Google the word mask, you get a definition like this. You can read it on the screen. And the important thing here is that they occurred in the private homes of wealthy aristocrats or at the court. So, as I said, Percy Mackay adds something radically new and revolutionary to the mask, in that he conceives of the mask on a large scale, a very large scale, as having a central place in a democratic civil society. Mackay constructed his masks to encourage and foster spirit remembering. He very much worked with the idea of the human being as a time being, and with the idea of the evolution of consciousness. His masks, they were staged to enlighten, not merely to entertain. They weren't just spectacle. They were meant to awaken spirit remembrance. Entertainment was not the main point. He really thought that the spectators would find sources, or actually the spectators and the participants, because these were very inclusive, large affairs, that people involved would find sources of spiritual nourishment that would lead to an ever more enlightened society, an ever more enlightened human being, and the enlightened progress of civilization. That was the high ideal. He added speech to his productions for this reason. Uh, pageants were largely unspoken, since speech, the revelation of the word, is a key element of drama understood in a Sophoclean or Shakespearean way, or in the sense of a mystery drama. Here's a picture of the ground plan of Percy's mask, Caliban by the Yellow Sands, staged in New York and Boston. And you can see the set is really huge. Uh, As Alice mentioned in the last meeting, these masks of Percy Mackay have of late received some attention when persons uh, organize pageants with homeless or unsheltered people as participants. But this was not Percy's idea. I don't think that they had the same concept of homeless or unsheltered in Percy's time. Percy would not have seen the unsheltered or homeless as the primary participants in his masks. They would not have been excluded, but he included everyone, and everyone responded to the call. Um, From a social historical reading, these were celebrations of the middle class and the values of of that class, uh, the progressive values of that class. Whereas before, in previous centuries, they had been elite aristocratic parties. So here again is a picture of the mask that Percy Mackay worked on for the 150th anniversary celebration of the founding of St. Louis in May 1914, right before the start of World War I. 
uh, Caliban by the Yellow Sands, which happened after this St. Louis event, uh, actually occurred at the time of, of at the time of World War I. So it was an equivalent artistic event involving large numbers of people to the event that we saw happening in Dornach at the time of World War I with the building of the first Goetheanum. So as you can see from the picture here, 7,500 people performed and 150,000 people witnessed the event. The St. Louis mask was followed by his mask Caliban by the Yellow Sands, which was performed in New York and afterwards in Boston. It's based on Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. And by the way, as I mentioned earlier, Isadora Duncan, who was a friend, performed a dance for it and, and enchanted everyone as she danced across the Yellow Sands solo. Uh, Caliban was offered as commemoration of the Shakespeare tercentenary. And remember that date, 1623, hint, hint. <laughs> We're approaching the 400 year of a critically important Rosicrucian publication but again, well, we will have to go more deeply into Percy's connection to Shakespeare in later meetings. I don't have time tonight. And I'll, I'll approach this topic from a spiritual, scientific, literary point of view if we get to it. For tonight's presentation, and we're almost done, I want to jump ahead to Percy Mackay's relationship with Albert Steffen and the Goetheanum, such as it was in the 1930s. This relationship came about through Percy's daughter, Arvia, who found her way independently with knapsack on her back to the Christmas Foundation Conference in 1923. In 1923, Arvia went to Europe as one of seven students from a youth organization. The purpose of sending Arvia and others was to open up a dialogue with the youth of Europe who were seeking new ways forward after the disaster of World War I. So, in other words, it was a similar dynamic to what we see in Dornach with the emergence of the so-called youth movement and later the youth section. To capture a flavor of what was in the air at the time, uh, consider that inflation was soon to hit an all-time high in Weimar, uh, Germany, Adolf Hitler and the National Socialists staged their first attempted coup d'etat with the Beer Hall Putsch in Bavaria. France and Belgium had taken occupation of an important industrial region in Germany, and these were all factors that led directly to World War II. Arvia had already heard about Rudolf Steiner from a family friend, and when she got to southern Germany, she set off with that knapsack on foot to discover Rudolf Steiner in Dornach. She was so impressed by what she found that in the autumn she returned, and as I said, she was present for the Christmas conference. She was 21. Later, her sister Christy went to Dornach, and Christy was present at the dedication of the newly rebuilt Goetheanum in 1928. I should also mention Percy Mackay's son, Robin, who was involved in this family destiny. Robin, Robin suffered an illness and mental breakdown, and he became a patient at a clinic in the Black Forest in the 1930s. While he was in Germany, Arvia was studying and working at the Goetheanum, and her sister Christy came to Dornach also, as I said. So with three children in Europe, Percy Mackay and his wife, Marion, uh, they of course had the desire to go to Europe also. And as a result, Percy Mackay met Albert Steffen. Arvia had already told him in a letter that there is a poet here in Dornach whom you should meet. She was very intuitive, and she's really worth one or two or several evenings in her own right. Arvia intuited the destiny connection between her father and and Albert Steffen, the two poets recognized one another, spiritually speaking, and felt almost at once an especially close bond, as if they were brothers or as if they had known each other in previous lives. It was an odd and mysterious but extremely important destiny meeting for them both. Uh, it's important for our section history, I think, that we consider this, 
And I hope that we ha will have more time in future meetings to go into this a bit more consequentially. But that's where I will leave things for tonight. Like I said, if the spirit of the time is willing, perhaps we can go farther with our exper exploration of Percy Mackay and the Mackay family. I hope I can say more things about, for example, Percy Mackay's relationship to Shakespeare, his deep and lifelong connection to Hamlet, Hamlet the play and Hamlet the character, or Percy Mackay's concept of civil theater and how his dramas and poetry find their place in a modernist context. Uh, Percy Mackay's work as a biographer and what this might mean to us in this section insofar as we try to practice spirit remembering. Percy Mackay and Emerson and the New England Renaissance, as I said, there's a, there's a red thread running between these two individuals. Uh, or the Mackay family destiny with anthroposophy and how that helps us to understand the year 1923 and the succeeding year events. And let us not forget that date, 1623. So on that note, I'll close tonight and thank you for your time and attention. Mm -hmm.